now we switch over our next scientific session. I am requesting to take over the charge, Dr. Nilufar Fatima Chaudhary and Professor Sabina Hashan. Please uh, continue the next session, this sunrise session. Thank you very much. Now it is time to off from this session. From my side, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome you all to be the ECO 2021. And it was the, uh, it is a, uh, we are running COVID era of second year of COVID era. Uh, we plan for this uh, ECO program to be done by in person, but uh, due to this COVID situation, we have shifted to virtual. So welcome you all to Sunrise Station. And these, uh, the chairpersons of these uh, sessions are uh, Professor K.M. Shirajul Haq, uh, Professor Nevin Chandra, Professor S.K. Parashar, and Professor A.K.M. Fazlur Rahman, Professor Mir Jamaluddin, uh, Dr. Rakesh Gupta, Dr. Nikin Brukle, uh, Dr. Shiraj Munira Lopa, Dr. Professor Mahabub Ali, uh, Professor Khandagar Shahid Hussain, Professor M.J. Ajim, and Brigadier General, Professor A.F.M. Samsul Haq. The panelists are uh, Professor Ranjit Chandra Khan, Professor M. Tohidil Haq, Professor M. M. Mukit, Dr. Ganapati Aditya, Dr. Nupur Kaur, Dr. Uh, S. M. Shahidul Islam, Dr. Dharipada Sharkar. And as a moderator, I'm Professor Sabina Hashim and Dr. Nilipar Chaudhary moderating the session. So this is our first scientific session, sunrise session. And uh, uh, first, uh, uh, the topic, uh, first uh, speaker is, the Professor Navin C. Chandra, he is a dis distinguished uh, professor of medicine and of and cardiovascular disease, University of Alabama at Birmingham, USA. So, sir, uh, his topic is echocardiographic assessment of LV function. Professor Navin C. Nanda. I am uh, Navin Nanda. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure and honor. Uh, for me to be invited uh, to this uh, very important meeting in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, when it comes to the echocardiographic assessment of uh, LV, I'm going to cone down uh, or focus on echocardiographic assessment of left ventricular ejection fraction. Well, actually, it's a very interesting. Uh, we wrote this editorial quite a few years ago, and uh, we mentioned that, uh, uh, you know, despite the fact that uh, magnetic resonance imaging is considered the gold standard for assessment of LV ejection fraction, uh, you know, most of the time we don't use MRI. Uh, in daily cardiology clinical practice, we use uh, echocardiography because it's readily available and it's also completely non-invasive without any uh, radiation. So what are the ways uh, we can look at the left ventricle ejection fraction? I'm going to be, have this uh, talk as a very basic talk uh, since it is supposed to be basic to advanced, but I'm going to talk mainly on basic aspects of uh, LV ejection fraction. Uh, one is visual assessment, which is eyeballing. Uh, it is accurate in experienced hands, but if the uh, person is not experienced, then there is a large inter and intra observer variability uh, as high as 17 and 13% respectively. The other method, which is approved by the American Society of Echocardiography, used to use the Simpson's method, where you do make some geometric assumptions, but we find that contrast is helpful if uh, the endocardial border is suboptimal. Sub One of the advances has come in there is actually looking at the 3D echocardiogram, uh, where you have less assumptions, low inter and intra observer variability, and it correlates very well with magnetic resonance imaging findings. And to add to that, now we have artificial intelligence based newer 3D approach, which is even more accurate. So when it comes to biplane Simpson method, uh, as you know, it's a commonly used echocardiographic method for assessment of uh, LV function. Uh, generally, we go for two planes, uh, apical four chamber view and apical two chamber view. And it divides the LV 
into a series of desks, disks, generally about 20. And you look at the area of this disk, and then you have also the thickness. And that way you try to calculate the uh, volume in and diastole and in systole, and then you get the ejection fraction. So this is the, uh, and the big, there's a little complex, uh, complex formula here, uh, but that is what the computer will calculate on your uh, machine, echocardiography effect machine. So this is the one. So here is to show that uh, this is the typical four chamber view, typical two chamber view, uh, and diastole and systole on both sides. And you minimize these areas, use that uh, Simpson's method, and you'll come out with the ejection fraction. So there are some limitations to this method. First of all, you are making geometric assumptions. You are, think all the disks are circular, and this is not going to be valid when there is LV shape distortion. For example, there is a very significant wall motion abnormality, or there is LV aneurysm. The other aspect is the LV apex is often foreshortened, and many times in difficult patients, you may have off-axis images. And important also, that you are only taking two views, apical four chamber and apical two chamber views, all other views like apical five chamber, short axis views are actually ignored. And endocardial dropouts happen, but their contrast echocardiography becomes useful to trace the endocardium. And of course, it depends a lot because you're going to select only one frame. And if you have arrhythmias or there is atrial fibrillation, where there's B to B changes LVEF, we are going to take only one frame and calculate the ejection function from there and not take into account the other beats uh, which, have, which are variable uh, in terms of the heart rate. And of course, if there's a dyspneic or moving patient, uh, that can also be a problem. Uh, you, very important when you do the planimetry, you avoid, must avoid trabeculations and papillary muscles when you trace the endocardium. And many times uh, we have a good apical four chamber view, but not that good apical two chamber view and CPM mode, and I'll show an example of that, is preferable because you can see the endocardium better. And also when it comes to contrast echocardiography, you need, there is some um, learning curve for, for the technique. Uh, sometimes if you give too much contrast, you get basal shad shadowing with contrast and to wait. And a, a very important limitation of 2D echocardiography is that each 2D image is only a very thin slice of the heart. So those are the limitations of uh, uh, biplane Simpson method. I'm going to show you this one here, a single image, but I, I'll move it also. And you can see the contrast here delineates the endocardium very well. So in a patient like this, uh, you can make a very good, uh, I, I, you can make a very good example, uh, or you can calculate the ejection fraction very well. And this is the apical four chamber view. And then if I go to the next slice, I can show the apical two chamber view also. Uh, here again, apical two chamber view, and there's no right ventricle here, so there's really apical two chamber view, and one calculate the ejection fraction from these with contrast echocardiography using the biplane Simpson method. A moving patient becomes a little difficult because even if you use contrast, uh, the whole thing is moving, and uh, when it comes to selecting a single frame, uh, maybe more difficult. Uh, this particular patient is sitting up, or there may be a patient who is on ventilator in the ICU, so it will become very difficult sometimes when you have a dyspneic or a moving patient. And here again, I'm trying to get the two chamber view, but the LVF, uh, LV still comes in here. Uh, I mean, the sorry, it should be the RV. RV still comes in here, and we are really only looking at the, um, at the uh, LV here. It's not really a good chamber view. It's kind of a partly like a four chamber view only. So that's one problem. Uh, one really should try to get a very good apical two chamber view where you don't see the right ventricle at all. Now here is um, another patient where a definitive was given and let me uh, run it. And, uh, and again, endocardium border is not very easy to trace out here. And I will show in this single frame. Uh, for example, here you are tracing it. There are a lot of uh, uh, transverse lines here. So it becomes very difficult to trace exactly where the endocardium is. Is it here? Is it somewhere inside? Is it outside? In a patient like this, uh, a mistake can easily be made uh, by the computer in calculating ejection fraction. For example, here, the computer, the ejection fraction, uh, made the ejection, ejection fraction as 41.4% here. 
and then we go into the uh, two chamber view again it's not the best uh, i mean four chamber view 41.4 percent is ejection fraction now this is a two chamber view in the same patient and the ejection fraction came out to be 48.3 percent so if you take the average it will be something like 44 percent or 45 percent would be the ejection fraction which would go for mild lv dysfunction and then you go for this so the computer sometimes in the machine also will do it by the tishholz method uh, which is really we should never use that method at all but the computer will do it sometimes and you only look at one short axis view here like this one here one uh, one uh, um, uh, dimension and from there you try to calculate ejection in any case this all came to be very similar what was seen on Simpson's biplane method, something like 42.1%. Now, when I look at this patient, now I'm looking at it visually. I'm looking at visually, I'm going to look at all the views, all the views here. And if I look at all the views, uh, one can see that I can't call this uh, mild dysfunction. It's really very good. The, both the endocardium, uh, you know, all, all, always look at the endocardium, never the epicardium uh, when you are looking at LV function. And that's why the contrast echocardium becomes useful. It's moving very, very well. So really, I can't call it mild dysfunction, which was uh, which which what came out with Simpson's method. Uh, I will just say, come up and say, ejection is normal, maybe 55 to 60 percent, or even 60 uh, to 65 percent in that range. So here again, another view for chamber view, very good actually. A motion uh, here. We are going for two chamber view. No RV here. I mean, no LV uh, shows up. Uh, no RV shows up here only the LV, and again, see, it moves very, very well. The ventricle is moving very, very well. So in this patient, I will I disagree completely with the Simpson method. It is another one where a little bit of the uh, RV shows up, but again, very normal uh, function here. Here is something like apical five chamber view, the aorta at the bottom here, again, normal function. So in this patient, I would report it as normal function by visually, even though the Simpson's biplane method, which is what everyone recommends, all the guidelines recommend, uh, gives a different figure, different uh, actually figure for ejection fraction. So that is very, very important uh, to look at everything and uh, here. Now, of course, when it comes to LVEF, there are some limitations, uh, especially if you're following the patient up to see there's an improvement in LV ejection fraction, because you that time you need to make sure the blood pressure is about similar than what it was before. And also the filling pressure, it will depend on the filling pressure and also the heart rate. Uh, for example, here, uh, here are two patients. Uh, th this is without contrast echocardiography. If you look at this particular patient, it looks like the function is quite poor here. Uh, and then when you look at this uh, here, it has definitely is improved. But now I know I checked the blood pressure. The blood pressure was similar between this. It was one month apart. The blood pressure is very similar. And I look at the heart rate, 77, 75 beats per minute. Again, it's very similar. So I think I can compare this uh, very easily. Uh, these two and say that there was a definite improvement. Otherwise, the improvement may not be real improvement, maybe just because of the changes in blood pressure and heart rate. So those are also very important when you do a follow-up examination for LV ejection fraction. Now, let us go again now to actually the echocardiography. Remember, the echocardiography is only a thin slice of the ventricle. Uh, it doesn't give you the whole of the left ventricle, which is a big limitation. On the other hand, when you go for 3D echocardiography, uh, it will give you a pyramidal section. You get many more slices stacked together. So it gives you uh, uh, essentially battery ejection fraction. Now, the 2D echocardiography came on the scene in 1976. And uh, actually within three, four years, we realized the problem with 2D echocardiography. We thought we should really go for 3D echocardiography. And we did do actually, so we were one of the first ones to do three-dimensional uh, reconstruct echocardiographic images here using the rotation method. And we had good correlation. Uh, with the um, angiocardiography as well as in the in vitro settings. But it took quite a bit of, it took quite a while uh, before 3D echo became um, more uh, more commonplace in, uh, and many more machines having 3D echocardiography now. Uh, what, is a, uh, what is a big advantage? The big advantage is there are no mathematical assumption about the shape of the left ventricle. It's more reproducible and much more uh, accurate than 2D echocardiography. So this is the 3D determination of LV volumes. So this was made possible by this uh, development of this matrix probe, uh, where you could actually get a large pyramidal section of the, of the heart. For sure, in most patients, unless the left ventricle is very much dilated, uh, you will be able to get the whole ventricle in that, uh, in that data set 
so you can actually get a very good idea of the function and ejection fraction of the ventricle. You can also the angle correction I mentioned about that uh, many times there is apical shortening, which means uh, that uh, the distance between the apex and the base of the ventricle is actually foreshortened. So you really want to maximize the distance. Let me play this. So you want to maximize the distance between the apex of the ventricle and the base of the heart. So what you can do is in the 3D section, 3D is very good for that. You move your cursor around and maximize the distance between the apex and the base. And then you calculate the left ventricle injection fraction. Here, for example, the ejection fraction came out to be 62.8%. And also we got the volumes here. And you can check. And if you don't like the way everything was traced, you can adjust it. But you can see the tracing of the endocardium uh, in the short axis views, always in the apical four, five chamber, all views you can see this here. So that, that angle correction is very important. And that is what one of the big advantages of 3D echocardiography. Also, just to show you that uh, once you get one apical four chamber view, from there you can get all other views. For example, if you crop a little more anteriorly, you get a five chamber view with aorta included, included there. You have RV, LV, RA, LA, and also aorta now here. And then if you cut uh, through this, through the left ventricle, you can section through the left ventricle, as you'll see, I'll do it. Then you'll also be able to get a two chamber view. Oh, yes, here I'm cutting it, coming up right to the, uh, in the middle of the left ventricle, turning it around. And if I do that, just to show you that this, this is possible, and you actually get a two chamber view, there's no right ventricle here, only left ventricle and left atrium. And if I go more anteriorly, I can include the aorta, the so-called three chamber view comes in. So, and also I can take short axis view, which I'm not showing, but you can get also short axis views of the, the ventricle also very easy. Uh, so that way the whole ventricle is in, in your hand, so to speak, and you can crop it anywhere you want. You can look at it, you can look at the function very well, and the computer can calculate the ejection fraction as well as the volumes of the left ventricle. Now, of course, uh, artificial intelligence has been introduced. What the manufacturers have done it, they've carefully traced the endocardium of many, many ventricles from many patients, fed that into the computer, and then let the computer decide. So what is artificial intelligence? It's really asking the machine to think like a human being. Now, you really cannot think exactly like a human being, but you want to make it as close to possible as the human being, as the brain of a human being thinks. And that, uh, that actually makes it easier uh, and more accurate to get the ejection fraction. For example, here, one can get the LV volumes uh, in using artificial intelligence in 3D echocardiography, as well as the volume of the left ventricle. Can both these LV and LA can be calculated very well using artificial intelligence. So that's the new thing we have now. No, not only that, very recently, uh, there, there have been uh, some work done where you can actually use contrast echocardiography. Before you could, when you do a 3D echo, uh, the, you couldn't actually calculate the volume without con uh, with, with contrast echocardiography. Now you can calculate the volume with contrast echocardiography, make it even more uh, accurate. So now we have artificial intelligence, 3D echocardiography, and also contrast echocardiography. What about the LVF? There are many reference limits for LV ejection fraction here. Depends on, uh, as you can see, men, women, age, et cetera, uh, because very difficult to remember. So the best classification, in my opinion, is what the American College of Cardiology has put up clinical criteria. Those are the easy way to remember. So hyperdynamic ventricle, LV ejection fraction greater than 70%, normal would be from 50 to 70%, mild dysfunction, 40 to 49%, moderate dysfunction, 30 to 39%, severe dysfunction, less than 30%, very easy. Severe dysfunction, less than 30%. Moderate dysfunction, 30 to 40, 30 to 39. Mild dysfunction, 40 to 49. And once you go to 50 and more, uh, that is normal ejection fraction. 50 to 55, you can call it low normal. And once you exceed 70%, you call it hyperdynamic. So this is a very easy classification to remember and very practical. So I feel if, you, if the beginners of you go, go for this, uh, and this is the best one rather than trying to remember uh, all those numbers uh, from the other classification. I've got three quizzes here for you very quickly uh, regarding the uh, superiority of live real-time 3D TTE over 2D TTE in the assessment of LV ejection fraction. The following statements are correct. The following statements are correct, except no assumptions are used regarding LV shape. Correct, 3D doesn't have any assumption regarding LV shape. Give superior quality means no. 
because the 3D images are dependent on the 2D images. The 2D images are good, 3D images are good. 2D images are not good, 3D images won't be good. So it doesn't give superior quality images. It tends to avoid LV4 shortening and has less intra and intra observed variability correct. It has excellent correlation with MRI measurements correct. So the correct answer here is give superior quality images because that's the exception. It doesn't give superior quality images. Next quiz I have is visual estimation of LV function by 2D TT is useful except when image quality is suboptimal with incomplete endocardial bot definition. This is still useful because you are looking at all the images, your mind's eye looks at all, even the, the, the endocardial dropout, you look at all the images, so you can get good idea about the LV function. It's a clinical study, not a research protocol, yes. Uh, because if a research protocol, then you need volumes. And when you, do, uh, when you look at ejection fraction visually, you cannot get volume, you can only get ejection fraction. Both LVF and volumes are needed, which is the same thing, which is not, that, that would actually be, uh, that would be the correct answer. Both LVF and volumes are needed, that's the exception. And the reader is an experienced echocardiographer, yeah. You need, um, uh, even if there's incomplete endocardial border, visual estimation is good. Uh, the reader is an experienced uh, echocardiographer, is good. It's a clinical study, not a research study, is good. Uh, but if both LVF and volumes are needed, it's not a very good study. And the last one, the most commonly used 2D echocardiographic method, for assessment of LV ejection fraction is bullet method, t formula, aerial length method, biplane Simpson method. Well, the most commonly used, most recommended method is biplane Simpson method, but it has got its own limitation. So whenever you are actually assessing LV ejection fraction, remember, you really need to look, use everything. Look at uh, biplane Simpson, check see how it has been traced. Look at the visual method. And, uh, and if you're experienced, you have a lot of good experience with echocardiography. The visual method is very good, actually, also. And then if your machine has it, uh, got a newer machine, then definitely go for 3D echocardiography, and especially with 3D echocardiography, artificial intelligence, and contrast echocardiography. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I'm just going to give this uh, for mainly the basics of uh, LV ejection fraction. I'm not going to know very advanced technology here, only the basics of echocardiography. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, uh, Naveen C. Nanda, sir, uh, for your excellent presentation on LV um, assessment. Uh, now I'm going to uh, uh, call the second presenter, who is Dr. Sherazim Munira Lopa, Assistant Professor of Clinical Medicine, Well Colonial Medicine, um, New York, and Faculty of uh, ECA, ECA uh, School of Medicine in Mount Sinai, New York, USA. Um, her topic is echocardiographic uh, finding in COVID patient and importance of contrast echocardiogram. Please welcome Dr. Shirazim Munira Lopa. Please let her unmute herself first. Can you hear me, Dr. Sh Munira? Assalamu alaikum. Good morning, good evening, according to the part of the world. And it is, uh, thank you so much for inviting me in this wonderful ed educational conference of echocardiography. It is my real pleasure to be here today. So today my topic will be echocardiographic finding in COVID-19 patient. All of us, we know we are going through the COVID era. And uh, so I like to present some cases which I um, experienced in my last two years of taking care of COVID patient. And uh, at the end, I'll, I'll, I'll like to touch a little bit about the importance of contrast echocardiography. Uh, so actually, I like to discuss about the case-based uh, approach. So case one is uh, 86 years old female was brought to the emergency room by EMS due to the respiratory distress, the patient had a past medical history of hypertension, vertebral fracture with chronic lumbar pain. So um, yeah, so 86 years old female with a lot of past medical history was, ad um, was admitted with uh, actually initially with the um, respiratory distress, shortness of breath and cough. So in initial presentation, it reveals the oxygen saturation level was 50% and that improved to 80% via non rebather marks and with a oxygen flow rate of uh, 15 liter per minute. 
and the respiratory deterioration of the patient warranted by PAP, which is a non-invasive uh, positive air pressure ventilation. And the uh, intervention, after this intervention, we were able to uh, achieve the um, uh, saturation to 95%. And the assessment of the vitals reveals normal result, include only excluding the abnormal respiratory rate of uh, 30 beats per minute. And the physical examination of the patient was consistent with respiratory distress, diffuse bilateral pulmonary crackle, mild jugular venous distension, and minimal bilateral fatigue edema. And the initial diagnosis workup revealed COVID-19 positive. On second day of admission, so we can see that patient was not clinically uh, um, hemodynamically unstable and patient was home. We are able to hold the saturation above 95 with the BiPAP machine. But on second day of admission, the patient further required endotracheal intubation and systemic hemodynamic support to mitig um, uh, mitigate her clinical deterioration. So what happened on that time? So we ran through, uh, I will present in short actually with the significant labs and how we proceed the and end up with the diagnosis. So initially when patient got admitted, uh, patient's uh, tr troponin T was uh, 0 0.016 and uh, that was, uh, the, the troponin was tended uh, with the ACS uh, acute coronary syndrome protocol in our hospital like every six hours. And the second day when patient deteriorate on that time, the troponin raised up to 1.18. Also, we are uh, with the lab, other lab value only significant was the pro BNP was 2056. And I want to mention the D dimer was 398, which is not actually extremely high. It is high, but not very high. So after that, we took the chest X-ray and the chest X-ray in the initially during the presentation, it was some, there was some pneumonia and that uh, interstitial, interstitial lung disease. But after the deterioration, uh, we took the um, uh, repeat X-ray, which was showing almost the right side is ground glass and, and the airspace disease as well. And uh, also the congestive, uh, con congestive changes. And the EKG, actually electrocardiogram in Bangladesh, we call ECG and here we call EKG. So initially the EKG was kind of almost normal looking, not very significant, maybe some old septal infarct and sinus rhythm. But after deterioration of the clinical status, uh, we can compare the electrocardiogram from the initial day is there is a newly developed ST elevation in V1 to V, uh, um, almost uh, V1 to V5, and also some ST depression in the inferior lead. So which was giving us the impression, most likely patient is having, most likely having coronary, acute coronary syndrome. Then we uh, had actually echocardiogram and echocardiogram was showing that it is actually from mid to distal apical total global hypokinesia along with the very proximal preservation of ejection fraction. And uh, this was the definitive uh, contrast study of the LV. This is, was in the diastole and this is in the system, which really doesn't correlate with the wall motion abnormalities or any vascular territory. So it's it proximal uh, proximal good contraction along with mid to distal ballooning or dilatation. So all of us, we know, it's likely we, we diagnosed uh, the um, cardiovascular assessment was a stress into cardiomyopathy or Takasubo cardiomyopathy and determined that the ejection fraction is 35 to 40% with uh, mid to distal akinesis and proximal uh, preserved uh, LV function in the proximal segment. And the patient didn't undergo for the left uh, heart cath because due to deterioration of the renal function and patient, I initially mentioned patient has a history of microcytic, long-standing microcytic anemia. So with the severe microcytic anemia and deterioration of renal function, we couldn't uh, continue with the cardiac uh, catheterization and patient condition did not improve despite all possible treatment, respiratory support and systemic hemodynamic support. So this is one of the complications can happen actually with the 
COVID-19 um, uh, uh, COVID uh, patient and who may can develop myocarditis and taka, even cardiomyopathy may not be on myocarditis, solely can be takasubo or stage into cardiomyopathy. So we had total, I experienced total four cases and actually we published the cases on that time like coronary uh, disease, COVID-19 induced cardiac supercardiomyopathy in geriatric setting because all four of our patients uh, uh, didn't survive in spite of all um, measurement and all treatment and hemodynamic support. It can be searched in the PubMed too. So this is one of the complication from the COVID. And uh, case two is 51 years old man presented to our emergency department with chest pain suggested of pericarditis, means patient had actually retroesternal and it is intensified when coughing and lying down, eased up with uh, eased by sitting up position. So, and dyspnea on exertion and deterioration of general condition. And he had history of asthma active smoking. So found uh, initially patient was uh, found to have the uh, RT-PCR positive with the COVID-19 virus and also patient had a troponin elevation. And this was the electrocardiogram of the patient. And we all of us, we can see that uh, it was very prominent. We call it electrical alternates, like it's going kind of wavy up and down. And all of us, we know that diagnosis is already, most likely this patient had my pericarditis and pericardial effusion from there. So this is another very common, especially whenever a patient is complaining chest pain. Chest pain can be from the COVID pneumonia too. But if patient, maybe the approach should be, we should run the cardiac uh, enzyme troponin. And if troponin is elevated, we should consider getting echocardiography because it is giving us the different, different modalities of diagnosis of cardiac complication of COVID-19. And uh, third case, uh, the patient presented with, in the emergency department with a tender history of fatigue, fever, and dry cough. And chest uh, radiography revealed bilateral interstitial density consisted with coronavirus disease. Continuous positive ear pressure was started with clinical benefit, but few hours later, he developed hemodynamic instability and deoxygenation. And then we did actually the echocardiogram. This is the echocardiogram. All of us know it is very, very uh, known uh, that we call it McConnell sign, means the apex of the RV is moving well, but whole RV is dilated and hypokinetic and also is giving the parasite paradoxical septal move on the left side. So paradoxical septal uh, movement uh, due to the right RV, dil RV dilatation and uh, volume and pressure overload from the RV, whole di RV dilated, hypokinetic, but apex is sparing the apex. That called McConnell science means that means patient was diagnosed. So best side, that is actually my patient bedside echocardiographic uh, finding which revealed high right uh, high risk for P. So patient was getting massive P with evidence of right ventricular dysfunction and free floating thrombus in right heart chamber. So systemic thrombolysis was administered with excellent clinical and hemodynamic responses. So this is the three uh, cardiac complication who, high, uh, who, what, who I, personally experienced, I wanted to present. So it's not only, all of us, we know about the PE, pulmonary thromboembolism from the COVID and the complication, but it can give myocarditis, pericarditis, pericardial effusion, and even stress cardiomyopathy. So if patient is complaining of chest pain and if troponin comes back positive, we should keep in mind all this together. So it's not only massive PE, it can be pericardial effusion, even tamponade, or it can be Takasubu cardiomyopathy. So my another topic actually, 
was the importance of contrast echocardiography. I just want to touch it in very short, and uh, Dr. Nanda already showed some uh, picture of the how to calculate the LV function with the definity. So definity is actually part fluent. It's a lip lipid microspore. And uh, lip uh, we know that in the sono um, sonographic uh, uh, um, uh, ultrasono images, the lipid shows as a bright red in contrast trust with the grayish or blackish myocardium. So that gives us very uh, unique definition of endocardial border. And that is the way we can really figure out the wall motion abnormalities of the LV if we are experiencing any MI. So systole and diastole, uh, systole and diastole, it helps us to give. So I will just uh, show some of the picture how we can a uh, patient can get benefit out of the contrast echocardiography. So one is the LV function. So this is actually one of the my patient also. So how we can see the LV function very nicely here before going taking the patient in the cath lab. So uh, diagnosing the wall motion abnormalities is very important. So here we can see that patient uh, is actually the septum is working. This is a four chamber view and septum is moving fine, but this anterolateral wall is not moving at all. And that patient had uh, the anterior LAD, proximal LAD lesion, and that was giving us wall motion abnormality. So this is very nicely seen with the contrast echocardiography rather than only 2D echocardiography. That's very, very important. And the second case I want to see, this is the benefits a lot of time. Whenever we do that uh, 2D echocardiography, we may not be able to see the LV cavity properly because it's kind of myocardium is grayish and black looks black. So the definition may not come very clearly. So if we give the contrast, and this is the same patient actually, this is the 2D, which we don't see anything almost at all inside the LV cavity. But after giving the contrast, the image is showing there is a big LV thrombus. So this kind of difference uh, we can make with, for the patient that to diagnose this LV thrombus. Okay, so that is, uh, that's contrast. Uh, this is for the contrast with definity or contrast with a lipid microsphere, like lipid particle or perfluent. I want to see, show uh, and case, discuss another case with echocardiography with bubble study. This is also a contrast study. So how complicated and uh, so echocardiography is really a sophisticated method to diagnose a lot of complicated cardiovascular disease in a non-invasive way. This is also one of my patients uh, that we diagnosed only with the echo and the bubble study. So he was a 63 years old man with significant post-medical history of pulmonary hypertension on treatment for last 20 years and presented with epigastric pain. The physical examination was unremarkable except for a cardiac murmur heart at the left sternal border. The laboratory data includes complete blood count, electrolytes, amylase, lipase, where within everything was normal li limit except for it, uh, pro-BNP was higher, high um, up to 6.14, and that, that's all. And that was the only abnormal finding. So patient came with abdominal pain. Patient had only abnormalities was some murmur with the physical finding and lab the pro -BNP was high. And patient has a 20 year history and on the treatment of pulmonary hypertension. Okay, so this was the first, uh, all of us, we know the parasternal long axis view of the patient. So we are all, every, all of us we here are oriented about the left atrium, left ventricle, LVOT, aortic valve, mitral valve, and the RV. 
and RVO side especially. And this is the big one is the coronary sinus. And this initially in the first look, people might think about this is the aorta. Actually, this is not the descending aorta. We can see it's inside the pericardium. So it's, in the, it's the close to the myocardium. So it's a dilated coronary sinus. And this is our outside the pericardium. This is our descending thoracic aorta. So after looking at this picture, it first thing came in my mind that why the coronary sinus will be so dilated. Yeah, patient has the history of pulmonary hypertension, but it is kind of still like too dilated to be only from the primary pulmonary hypertension. So then next, the fourth chamber view, how the fourth chamber view was looking like. So fourth chamber view said it's very small LA, LV, the right side is, RV is quite the most dilated chamber and the largest chamber in the heart is the right atrium. And also we can see that coronary sinus is also dilated. So that was giving us some suspicion that there might have some congenital disease, which is actually the coronary sinus mostly get dilated. That is persistent left SVC, which is a congenital disease. So just for the reminder and just refresh, all of us, we know the anatomy, just I want to uh, remind ourselves and maybe myself again, that our right side, right, uh, right atrium has uh, the three things get drained, right? Superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, coronary sinus. And in a congenital life, we, we usually all of us, we have, we, we, all of us, we had that left superior vena cava, which drains in the coronary sinus. But as we grow up gradually, it, the part of the, the connection between the left and right SVC become the- Sorry to interrupt. You have only one minute to finish your lecture. Thank you. Uh, um, brachiocephalic vein and then rest of the part of the left superior vena cava become hemiagigous vein. So it don't exist in the adult life, but if somebody has the left SVC persistent, in that case, the left arm of the hand get drained with the left SVC and la right arm vein get drained with the right RVC. So what we can do, if we inject some bubble, from the left side of left arm vein, it will go to the coronary sinus. And if we inject some uh, bubble from the right arm, and it will go directly to the right atrium. So how it looks like whenever, um, um, I'm so sorry, I really want to, uh, share the video of the, I'm not. Uh... Thank you. Uh, sorry, sorry, Dr. Munira. <laughs> we okay, have to all right. The next so uh, just uh, let me uh, give you the conclusion of uh, my talk. So uh, if we do the, actually that uh, um, injection from the right side, uh, left side, it goes to coronary sinus first, then right, uh, right ventricle. And then if we inject from the um, uh, other side, from the left side, it goes to the um, um, coronary sinus. So from the left side, it goes to the coronary sinus and from the right side, it goes to the right atrium. So that's how we can even diagnose with the bubble study, very complicated um, uh, congenital anomaly. So my patient was transferred to, uh, and, uh, to the car, um, CT surgery, coronary, uh, cardiovascular surgery and got uh, operation. And so patient was getting last 20 years uh, um, treatment for the pulmonary hypertension, but which is actually really not a pulmonary hypertension, which is actually a congenital anomaly of the heart. And after the correction, patient got better and there is no more pulmonary hypertension. And we published that paper in Taylor and Francis and that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shiraji Munira. Uh, then uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Colonel Dr. S.K. Parasha from India. Thank Sir, you for uh, his topic is uh, LS uh, strain imaging. Sir, please, sir. <clears throat> Let her remove the slide first, then I can put my slides. Yeah, yeah I removed. 
Stop sharing, please. Well, two points before I start. I have been given one of the most difficult topics of the whole conference. So it may be difficult for the beginners or so. And number two, I have to compensate for Dr. Monira's over talking by trying to finish within 15 minutes. So I may have to rest a bit or so. So coming to this topic, uh, one important thing is that the traditional methods used for the evaluation of the left atrium has been left atrial diameter and very important is left atrial volume index and many other Doppler methods. And they, stay, they still hold the place in the evaluation of the various diastolic functions. However, it has been seen that LA volume index could miss an early dysfunction and was found to fall with and the hand was is the focus of various studies to be done to find out the value of strain. Now, I don't know how to bring it down now. Strain, strain is the deformation resulting from an implied fold. We won't go into the details of the strain. It is, it will be possibly discussed by the next speaker or so. So, so the LA strain, you know, it is a new and a promising method to assess LA function with a diagnostic accuracy of about 95%. It is more sensitive than conventional parameters of atrial function and changes occur much earlier before the LA volume index occurs from the system. So the same thing I did, it demonstrates alterations prior to alterations in LA volumes. Now, remember one thing that there is the, the LA modules modulates LV filling by three mechanisms. This is, these are the most important slides Number one, when we take RR as the zero reference point during systole, there is a maximum filling of the LA volume because of because the LA is in diastole, so it is filled up, and this is known as a reservoir function, which contributes to 40%. So reservoir function is a systolic phenomena. Then comes an early diastolic phenomena. In early diastole, this is known as a conduit function. And this looks like an E wave of the mitral Doppler because the mitral the, the, the mitral ball opens and the, the blood forces into the left ventricle. Then the later part of the diastole, like an A wave of the of the of the mitral Doppler, that is the contractile function of the left atrium. So this contractile function of the left atrium known as the booster function, it gives about 25% of the blood. So that whenever we do an LA strain or anything, we can demo, we should demonstrate three types of strains that the reservoir, conduit, and a contractile function based on the ECG findings. Now, now see, this is how it looks like. Say so this is a peak, a peak of the R wave, and this is a QRS complex. Now you see the the it going up or so. So this is the reservoir stain. This you see it is a systolic phenomena, and where the and the peak of the reservoir strain is measured at the peak atrial longitudinal strain. So the top of the reservoir strain is the peak atrial longitudinal strain, and so this is occurs during the systole. Then this is the conduit strain. This is a conduit phase like that of the IBC, which is an early diastole, and this is a, a booster function or a contractile strain. So that a reservoir strain, a conduit strain, like a conduit phase of a mitral warp Doppler and a contraction strain, they can be easily determined by a by these functions and the and the peak measure is here. So this is a this is going above or a positive wave or so. So these are the three things which we see in a in a, in this function. A recording of the LA strain is by various methods, but the most important method currently is the 2D speckle tracking, and the 3D may come a bit later on or so. So so when you take a strain 
and and you and you trace the endocardium or myocardium of the la you see the la is divided into six segments both in four chamber view and two chamber view and this white dotted line is the average of all this longitudinal strains which we have taken so these are the segmental strain and the average is shown as a dotted straight line so this is the average a peak actual longitudinal strain and this is how we it looks like so now the, the, the most important thing is how to acquire an la strain matlab we must ensure a good and a stable ecg with a good p wave because the peak of the qrs was taken as a zero referral point optimize a focused la view or a or a four shot and lv view now 3d echo and various studies have shown that the long axis of the la and the and the lv are not in the straight line also so if a slightly four shot and lv view is taken four chamber it gives a maximum la diameter and we acquire 3 to 5 consecutive beats for example what it has been shown is that you see this is the same focused la view and the standard this is the focused la view and this is the standard four chamber view and you can see the la volume or la diameter is much more in a slightly sub optimal view rather than a classical four chamber view then when you when you trace the endocardium you do not include the pulmonary vein and the left atrial appendage they are excluded from the from the from the from the when you trace the endocardium and a zero reference point is still rr and not pp or so some of the challenges of acquiring la strain are a thin la wall so that the myocardium may be very very thin so how which one to 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 use as a sort of a roia and number two sometimes there is an extremely mobile interatrial septum so that it is very difficult to trace the septum then there can be a septal drop out and as i have mentioned we do not include pulmonary vein fossa valis and the and the appendage and the another challenge is that it is positioned in the far field so difficult to image and we should avoid la for shortening so this is something for example if you see here now you see say the it is a, a maximum la volume has been taken with a slightly four shortened la view but there is a, a break in the septum it is not in nst but so that when you trace this it becomes slightly difficult but that is what but sometimes when you do a regular practice i think this will not be a difficult thing so what are the normal values say a joint studies of about 40 studies have shown that a reservoir strain is about the mean is about 39.4% a conduit is the 23% and the contractile is 17.4% and the whole is mentioned in a big study in a, in jes 2017 and you can refer to that actual that this is the average normal strain values now the one thing which has been studied by thomas morvick and lisa thomas is that sometimes a strain rate occurred almost a decade before a change is occurred in the atrial facing volume that means the la volume index uh, this occurred almost a decade earlier and that was also shown in one of the studies that the patient had a normal la volume index patient had a normal ejection fraction and other things but they had already a reduced la strain so that the la strain came almost 25% of them showed a reduced la strain so that mean these la strain come much earlier before any of the changes occurring in the la thing so this functional classification and all the strain identified the various features now these are some of the few clinical indications that these are the most important are heart failure with preserved defection diastolic dysfunction and atrial fibrillation so coming to the heart failure preserved defection this la reserve reservoir strain which i said is a very important pattern to be discussed is associated with an adverse la remodeling and fibrosis and independent prognostic marker 
because in any in any of these studies the la ultimately bears the strain because of the increased la lb filling pressure so this la modeling occurs remodeling and there is a sort of a la reservoir strain associated with this and it is seen that when the la reservoir strain is less than 33% it predicted an invasively verified study that means it was more associated and connected with invasively verified studies with about 88% sensitivity and 77% specificity so that we mainly see for these values when we see for a preserved ejection fraction now some persons became more bold they said when i do after exercise the problem is when it is difficult to do it is rest how can do in exercise but they found a, a very a very simple test a passive leg lifting which we are nowadays doing in cases of, of a diastolic dysfunction or a latent diastolic heart failure very simple exercise performed anywhere any time no elaborate arrangement required economically while do a resting study marking a transducer position then some of your colleague lifts the leg of the patient manually up to 60 degrees for about 3 minutes and then you this which shifts blood into the la and it increases the preload and then we see how the la or the lv behave with this increased preload and the various lv strain is taking and then the study is repeated a very simple method and here you see in one of these studies they found that the the, the in 40 patients or so i can i don't like a shift here or so so they found that the the this was a routine method and here a global l strain was added at rest and it was global l strain after it leg lift and they found that assessing l strain during a left listing method was used as a much diagnostic better diagnostic method in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and it had excellent diagnostic capability as compared to these so many studies are now being done with simple exercise of a passive leg lifting so so the la reservoir and the contractile strain during leg lifts blunted in patients with heart failure in ejection fraction fraction with this is and they found that la strain of less than 31.2 and la contractile less than 15.2 had a good discrimination of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction with a sensitivity of 90 and 89% and specificity also so it may be worthwhile doing this very simple test and then repeating it again then coming to the diastolic dysfunction it is much more helpful in early diagnosis more informative than la volume index and la size so the the rate of abnormal la strain was significantly higher than an abnormal la vi the difference between 62.4% and 33.c that doesn't mean that la vi is not a good test is a very good test also but on comparison with the la strain so it is it correlates better with invasively determined lv and diastolic pressure as compared to la volume index so that means there are some of the definitely advantages of la strain for a diastolic dysfunction for example here you see you compare the la volume index you see the la volume index could help in the diagnosis of 15.5% but when the la strain was less than 23 it increased to 36.9% so that so that there is a definite advantage of la strain index as compared to the la volume in association with this similarly when you see that the difference when there is an increased la pressure the rate of abnormal strain was much higher and is more sensitive than ls lavi so if you see here it was 62.4% with an la strain of less than 23% as compared to lavi of more than 34 so that means that the abnormalities shown by la strain were much more significant as compared to the la volume index now this was this is a well known study done by marley group also you know as the la dysfunction increases the la volume increases 
so there is no problem in showing a, a discrimination in a normal person and those are showing a restrictive physiology. But in about up to 15% of the patients, they found it that there was very difficulty by a routine study to differentiate between grade one and two because they are overlapping, though they have a prognostic significance. So, so this was one of the courtesy, Nathan, Nathan Burkley, it was shown to see in a grade one, the, the value was about 30%. In grade two, it came down to 21%. And in grade three, it came down to 15%. So that in place of a simple LA volume index, the LA strain values were much more helpful in, dec in, decline, in, dec in increasing the diastolic grades and you see a progressive decrease and you can easily differentiate between these. And that was the value they showed in, a, in, in one of the studies. Now, these are the standard ASC methods also. So when the, when the LA strain was not used, the indeterminate was the, the, the rate of diastole was 13.5%. But when you added LA to 20, less than 23%, it increased to almost 23.4%. So all these slides show the significance or an importance of the LA strain as compared to the LA volume index. Now, this was just one slide of hypertension diabetes. All hypertension diabetes, they have some involvement of the left atrium. So this was a study, there was no left atrial enlargement and the controls were simple hypertension. hypertension. A control showed a value of 50%. In hypertension, it decreased to 29, in diabetes, 28, and combined 18.6. So this was those patients who did not have a LA enlargement, but showed a significantly decreased strain value because LA is involved in all these cases. So they showed a much better early values or so. The most important is atrial fibrillation. It is found in about 15 to 20, 41% of cases of uh, commonest clinical edema associated increase more in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. LA strain was more sensitive than volumetric measurements. So it is the strongest independent echocardiographic predictor of progression from paroxysmal to persistent AF and helps, it may help in a therapeutic point of view. And this was shown in one of these studies where they showed that the, in, a, in a, all the patients the LA global strain less than 30.9% had an adverse prognosis. And when they subdivided it, then even when the when the when the your when the LA's, LA volume index was, was less than 34, it still maintained the same thing. But when it was combined with the LA volume index, then of course the overall prognostic prognosis became bad. So this LA strain was the independent, strongest independent predictor in these cases. And out of 13, 313 patients, 16.6 developed permanent AF. So this is one of the criteria for which patients will develop a permanent atrial fibrillation. And based on this, a, a peak atrial contraction strain of less than 12.7%, a peak atrial longitudinal strain of less than 29% and a, a volume index of more than 43, 34.3, where the major diagnostic abnormalities in patients of atrial fibrillation, they progressed more to a persistent atrial fibrillation and had a very poor, a very poor prognosis in these, in these situations. So they are the greatest hazard in these patients. So the final important tip is familiarize yourself with technique. Spending time is the key to success. Practice till you get it right and then till you can't get it wrong. So go on practicing till you get it right and when you can't get it wrong and develop your lab standards. So in summary, a LA strain represents an accurate and reproducible technique to evaluate LA function. Uh, it has particular utility in three subjects, diastolic dysfunction, heart failure with projection fraction, and atrial fibrillation. LA strain and strain rate parameters are more sensitive than the conventional parameters of atrial function, especially LA volume. 
It is currently used as a research tool, but shortly will take over as an important day to day function in the LA functions also. But what is lacking are specific guidelines regarding its measurements, certain standardization and clinical indication. And the last slide, the limitations is, as I mentioned, it requires real training and expertise. Is it ready for a prime use in routine clinical practice? We, we hardly see any reports on the LA function, but at the time, till now it is being used more for the research purpose, but a stage is coming when we find that it will be more important because now we are getting a specified a, a machines we have is having a LA strains. Imaging for maximum LA dimension is still by trial and error. That which is that is when the, which one is the maximum volume you should try repeatedly as, as you see where you get a maximum LA diameter by a four shortened LV view. There is a vendor variability. So I would suggest in the end that please take some time. You record it and then study later on. But this will be, this is going to come as a very big thing in future. So please try to do it. Thank you very much. Now, because we are delayed, I'll be running to the hospital and I will try to reach there before the discussion starts. Otherwise, Naveen Nanda and Nitin Burkil are already there. Who can answer any questions if there is time? Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, uh, for your excellent overview on LA strain imaging. Uh, this is a relatively new modality, uh, many of uh, us, to many of us. Uh, so um, you are going for the next uh, speaker, Dr. Rakesh Gupta. He is the director and chief cardiologist, J uh, JROP Institute, Delhi. Uh, his topic is uh, 2D global longitudinal strain. So here I request Dr. Rakesh Gupta, please. Sir, can you hear us? Yeah, thank you very much. I can hear you very well. I hope you can see me too. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, everybody. In the last day of 2021, I hope that 2022 should be good for everybody. And we had seen a real pandemic in the last two years where everything has gone haywire. And the most important thing today is like reaching from an auditorium, going to a bedroom and then to a study room finally. And when you can deliver a talk without taking a bath and anything, and you just can do anything in this world sitting at home. That's what exactly this uh, pandemic has taught us in virtual platforms. So I'm going to talk on this uh, platform today on a two-dimension strain. If you look at this slide, almost in 1989, when this technology was initially initiated, more than 8 lakhs papers are available as on today in 2021. What is this strain? Is this one dimension, two dimension, three dimension, four dimension? And this cartoon aptly tells you what is the strain is. That's what exactly it means by how did it evolve and what is his role in a clinical practice? That's an important issue. Let me just go on this particular phenomena showing this slide. This is what we have been doing for last 1986 onwards, looking at a color flow velocity, ignoring myocardium. One fine gentleman started looking at the myocardium. Only fact was he kept on the color, blew away red towards like when the contraction of the heart was inside, it was red in color. When was a contraction was away from a outside, it was blue in color. So taking this technology, he came up with this particular idea of one dimension tissue Doppler imaging. Everyone is well versed of this particular technology, but heart is not made of single dimension fiber is considered of longitudinal radial and circumferential fibers. And they move in a different direction, not in one particular direction into formation of another kind of a technology, which was said and Idly classified as two dimensions technology, where we look at a sono micrometer moving from one point to another point, and then measuring this deformation in these particular segments individually rather than taking out the whole of the segments together, we came across this phenomenon of two dimension stain. This two dimension stain gave us a negative value as shown in this particular slide minus 17.7 at one time was shown as a cutoff, which almost 
everybody talks about 18 to 20 percent and that's what the shortening being related to a normal contraction this was applied to all the segments leading to a bull eye kind of a pattern where the global average longitudinal strain was depicted as shown in this slide is minus 19.3 that was not the only thing it tells you. It tells you about contraction. At the same time, it tells you about a time of a contraction that is synergy versus synchronicity. And that is the most important useful modality of two dimension strain is it tells, look, every segment is contracting, how much it's contracting and what is the time of contraction? This is aortic valve closer time. And it can be seen not in four chamber view, two chamber view or three chamber view. It can be seen in all segments talking of synchronicity as well as synergy of the contractions. One more thing, when we talk of these fibers, we look looking for a longitudinal fiber. We have to look for a radial and circumferential fibers also. And that fiber structure came into fact with the concept of this particular cartoon model Showing that the left hand fiber, they are the outer fiber, and the inside fiber, the right hand fiber, the contraction of left hand fiber in this direction, and the contraction of right hand fiber in this direction, leading to so called a torsion and twist. I'm not going to take going into detail of this. This is a basal function which talks of apical rotation. This is a basal rotation, and this is a neck twist which is evaluating radial and circumferential fiber. Here's a picture talking about apex versus base contraction. Then you can really well see one direction and goes in one direction, the other goes in right. So we have now longitudinal, radial, and circumferential fibers talking of all these kind of a things. And this not only located to left ventricle, it also located to right ventricle too. And we can really look at the right ventricle longitudinal stain by looking in four chamber view and a subcostal window. One of my previous successors has talked about Dr. Sirajum Munira has talked about pulmonary embolism. Believe my word, this is one modality where you can differentiate a pulmonary embolism in cases patient presenting with COPD or pulmonary embolism in emergency without looking at the LV, RV thrombus. If at all, it's not there. Let's look at multiple factors where it could be useful. I'm not even good able to cover everything, but I'll try to cover the major factors which I'm presenting over here. In clinical practice, LV function, most important thing, this is the bread and butter of everybody as on today. Then RV function evaluation, then come valves, cardiomyopathy, chemotherapy, CRT, and most important thing, the systemic illness, which we undergo day to day in our clinical practice. Let's look at the LV function. This is one slide which really talks about, published in 2019, if you are able to get a good two dimension stain that in fact tell you what is my ejection fraction is. And this is one paper talking of the same thing. Almost in one gist, I can say, if you are able to get a GLS of 18%, my ejection fraction has to be roughly, roughly three times of that GLS, that is 54%. And this is what the automated ejection fraction calculation has taken a lot of things. This is for my own lab where we recorded an automatic calculation of LV strain in a patient with a normal LV systolic function. What does it give you? Look, it's going to take a few minutes, like half a minute to one minute. In one go, it's telling you in three chamber view, the global longitudinal stain is 21.8%. That's not only the factors. Let's go to an, the next required image. That is four chamber view. As soon as we showed him the four chamber view, it gave you a four chamber view, two dimension strain. And look, it tells you not only the global longitudinal stain of four chamber is 21.2%. And all segments, they are contracting at the same time. And it gives you an ejection fraction of 57%. If you calculate that previous global longitudinal strain, multiplied by three, it will give you an ejection fraction of 57%. And now a two chamber view gives you an ejection fraction as well as a global longitudinal strain. And that's what is possible in today's system. The higher and newer, systems of one of the vendor talking about GLS ejection fractions and giving all values in one go. Here is 23% and 
all the parameters in one go with 61% <coughs> two dimensions ejection fractions. This is what the GLS today is for right, left ventricle. And it gives you a global longitudinal stain and average bullseye pattern and these kind of a values which can be done automatically. And it takes less than one minute to analyze the complete segments for the LV function. And that's what the importance is, has been said, is more reproducible measure for left ventricular function than ejection fraction, regardless of echocardiographic training. Mean to say that we have to get into this GLS evaluation more and more in a time to come. Let's show one by one, 47 year old male underwent stress sequence CAD evaluation image in two dimension digital format and a two dimension stain. Now look all four images together. And when we looked at pre and post, pre and post evaluations, this is give you a GLS of the same patient before this is before stress echocardiography and this is after stress. Look, there's no significant more decrease in a global GLS pattern in this particular subject. Now, another subject who had a walkover angina went on to do a digital stress echocardiography, spent time on this patient. This is resting, this is peak. This is resting, this is peak. And if you look at the peak images, you hardly find any wall thickening abnormalities. And once you look at this wall thickening abnormalities in three chamber and two chamber, everyone comes back saying that it is normal. So resting ECG was normal, peak stress ECG was normal, and we did a two dimension stain before stress, which shows an average of 0.6, 16.6, and some reduction in differential stain in these kind of a pattern. That is before stress, and look at this after stress. The whole territory which was seen before stress territory has disappeared, and we have seen a significant reduction of stain in the lateral wall territory of this particular seg patient after two dimension stain. This is zoomed up picture talking of possibly circumflex disease. Well, now this same patient, when we talked to him, look, you need a uh, medical therapy, you need an angiogram, your stress echo is normal, but two dimension stage is not abnormal. He said, no, I'm not going to have anything. I'm going to go back. He came after two days. Now look, his ECG changes started showing an infralateral wall ischemia after two days. And then he was taken for coronary angiogram, proximal circumflex disease, and finally PTCA was done. And this was amply substituted by this paper published in JS 2010. Another patient, 33-year-old, present, presented with heaviness just in 12 hours, diabetic, ECG normal, tropi normal. Echo on first day, here is an echo on first day. Spend time on this echo. Echo on the first day is almost appears to be normal. Then we did a GLS. GLS appeared to be normal in the subject. Normal ECG, normal tropi, normal echo two dimensions. Then despite this patient was advised admission for serial enzyme SC ECG in a coronary angiogram. He went home with the medical therapy, repeat enzymes, ECG and echo. Next day, though he was feeling better, but tropi was positive inverted T wave in AVL. And now the echo the second day, here is the echo of a four chamber view, two chamber view and a three chamber view, categorically showing that when we did a strain, it was significantly reduced in posterior, posterior lateral and anterior wall and reduction in GLS always. Now the tropi is positive, two dimension echo is almost normal. It suggests LCX territory. He was taken for a coronary angiogram, which came out to be positive subsequent. So that is what is the importance in a coronary artery disease. That's what we utilize in day-to-day -day practice in our lab, working for a coronary artery disease. Let's look at the prognostication of left bundle branch block. Look, everybody, when we look at the LBB, we just don't say anything. Look, you have got an LBB. You are doing reasonably fine. But look at the pattern of a GLS in these four chamber, three chamber, or two chamber view. Then radial stain versus neck twist. And if you put them all together, GLS, EA 40%, GLS minus 12, 40% GLS minus 12, less than 40% and GLS minus 12. Look at the significant deterioration. Mean to say that if you have a patient of a left bundle branch block, 
with ejection fraction, with GLS, you can really prognosticate their future survival. And that's what I mean to say with this particular slide. Ischemic cardiomyopathy, we do the same thing in our day-to-day -day practice. We look at the GLS, and if the GLS is, in this patient, is 6.2, and if we put in a GLS on this particular line, substantiated by this paper, the cutoff mark is minus 7. Anything more than minus 7 versus anything more than less than minus 7 versus more than minus 7 give you a prognostic survival of these patients. This is how in coronary artery disease, we can tell a patient, are you suffering from a CAD? And if you have developed ischemic cardiopathy versus LBB, what is your prognostic parameters? Not going to talk about diastolic function. Dr. Parashar sir has adequately spent time on this. We do utilize this modality in triple vessel disease. We do do a two-dimensional strain before and after stress. And whatever the territory after stress tells you, we pick up that vessel for an angioplasty, provided the patient is not agreeing for a CABG or coronary artery bypass surgery. Now comes RV function. Let me spend time on an RV function. This is again a slide for my own lab where we did a recording. How, what exactly do we look for RV strain? Here is two dimension strain. We look at a top say, correct? Now the next point will say, what do we look? We look for a tissue Doppler imaging by two dimension strain. So this is conventional method, what we have been utilizing over a period of time for almost last 10 to 15 years now. Now we go to the next pattern. Just give me a second, it'll come back again for the next second. I'm going to look at a tissue Doppler imaging for RV function. Here is a slide which talking of uh, RV function evaluation by TDI. And if I utilize all these things in artificial intelligence, looking at two dimension stain of RV, in one go, I can get all of the values, whether it's top say, RV free wall or RV two dimension strain. And that's what I'm looking for the next segment of the slide, that's automated evaluation. This is a time today, for a development where our students, where our PG students, where our youngsters can learn this modality by this auto artificial intelligence and automated imaging. In one go, they can calculate the, all the parameters of RV as we did in LV also. And here is, goes a specific processing. Now we are going to RV free wall, interventricular septum, and the apex. With this kind of an, a pattern, we can really look at a complete evaluation of RV two dimensions. Same, it'll give me a two minutes time and I'll request my chairperson to stop me at any time because this is one topic which is close to my heart and can speak for hours together. I've got more than 700 slides in this particular formats. So this is what now you see a complete parameters global longitudinal stain, free wall, and a tap say in one go. And the synchronicity of all six segments, you can get rid of these septal segments as on today, if you want. And that's what the automated imaging plus artificial imaging can give you. That's what I was trying to tell you in a, my previous speaker was, this is normal two dimension stain. This is acute pulmonary embolism. This is chronic pulmonary artery hypertension. When these kind of a patient, they present in casualty or emergency ward, what do we look for? If it's a normal, we have normal two-dimension stain. If it's a chronic pulmonary hypertension, it's generalized reduced two-dimension stain. And if it's a pulmonary embolism, we have an apical sparing where apical segments are contracting, mid and basal segments are significantly reduced in two-dimension stain. Take my word, do this in emergency ward, which we utilized in casualty, especially during COVID time, and we were able to make a good diagnosis of acute pulmonary embolism. Moving further, heart failure, prognostic value of tricuspid annulus tissue doppler in heart failure with atrial fibrillation. Look at the TDI velocity, RV free wall TDI velocity. If this TDI velocity is more than nine versus less than nine, Septal more than 7.3 versus less than 7.3. We have a significant prognostic implication in heart failure with 
atrial fibrillation who is going to do good who is going to do worst next comes aortic stenosis all of us understand we have a four category of aortic stenosis is the but the most important is low grade low flow low grade in severe aortic stenosis with paradoxical and in this subset of population what we look for we look for a gls and what that gls look for here is example for lg l lf lg paradoxical aortic stenosis where the gls is significantly reduced look at ejection fraction looks to be reasonably normal it's almost 60 to 65% it has to be because it's a hypertrophic vent grade velocity mean gradient is almost 40 mm of mercury but gls is low and these are the patient who have a normal function but low gradient look at the stain value this significantly low and here it comes hardy this is one patient whom we followed up before surgery low flow low gradient soon after surgery and 6 months after down the surgery look at the dramatical improvement in the global longitudinal stain of these patients and how do we do in follow ups cardiomyopathy many of you must have read if you have a left ventricular hypertrophy you can differentiate hypertensive heart disease with differential pattern with a cherry on ice pattern suggestive of i not say diagnostic of suggestive of possible amyloidosis then lvh in hypertensive heart disease very important thing which we utilize in day to day practice we look at an lv lvh then we look at a two dimensional stain a global gls and then follow up these patient over a period of time if those patient who have got a poor gls they do worst than a people who have got a normal gls and this is not a rocket sign it is not a big thing for a hypertensive subject who presented in our clinic day to day practice with asymptomatic hypertensive heart disease then echo messages you have a gls is sensitive important subclinical measure of a disease if followed seriously deterioration is a marker of poor outcome and that you can do easily very important thing in chemotherapy 58 year female with a ca breast on a chemotherapy and echo evolution look lv function appears to be reasonably very normal in this patient then when we look at the gls gls is almost 15.5 the earlier gls are all minus 20 and there's almost more than 5% for drop of gls in this particular subject of patient should we take up for chemotherapy should we not take up for chemotherapy can decision can be taken or we can delay the chemotherapy in this subset of population if you have a drop of more than 5% of the previous gsl value what do you mean by 5% if the previous gls value is 20 if you reduce by 5% it is more than that 5% it means the patient has developed a subclinical lv radial stain although the paper is very old and many of my electrophysiological colleague they do not trust us in this particular modality less than 130 milliseconds of a radial stain is suggestive of a good a poor prognostic marker but if it's more than 130 we suggest that they are do reasonably well and on top of that constriction versus restriction this is one paper which is aptly present in many of the you do not utilize in this kind of practice if your apical longitudinal stain is reduced think of constrictive pericarditis if your apical longitudinal stain is preserved think of restrictive cardiomyopathy then diabetes mellitus this paper aptly tells you look at a gls strain value of a symptomatic patient with type 2 diabetes with a speckle tracking imaging it tells you that this is significantly reduced in those patients who have got the diabetes they have got a poor outcome then pregnancy is postpartum pericardiopathy that is what the answer is if you have a cut off value of almost 10.6% of a gls if you are postpartum cardiomyopathy has got 10.6% of the absolute value if it's more than 10% then if this is a presentation where you can say that patient is going to recover or not going to recover last one slide feasibility reproducing clinical implication and novel fully automated assessment of gls and this is published paper just now a few days back talking of the paper taking to manual gls versus automatic gls and then looking at these kind of a things in day to day lab in conclusion it says that the automated gls the one i showed you a couple of minutes back 
has got a significantly shorter time and is able to give you a much better value than a manual GLS. In conclusion, great technology, gorgeous picture, significant clinical utility, not only in established coronary artery disease, but the people who are at high risk of a coronary artery disease talk about it. With this few words, I hope stain is no more a stain for all of you. Thank you very much for your patience sharing on the last day of 2021. Thank you, uh, Rakesh sir. Um, so uh, it's a long time uh, that we, uh, we all did meet in, in person in conferences. So hope to see you in next 2020, 22 in, in person. Sure. So next topic is uh, uh, TE, Basic and Beyond by Dr. Nitin Barclay, a senior uh, cardiologist, Jupiter Hospital, Thane, India. You may continue, sir. Uh, uh, thank you, Bangladesh Society of Echocardiography for inviting me to talk on uh, transesophageal echocardiography. Uh, I am audible and my slides are seen well. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Um, transesophageal echo gives you an extraordinary window by using this kind of a probe, which is a fiber optic probe. And it has got a handle with all the, um, all the adjustments uh, uh, <clears throat> sitting here with the electronic uh, with the electronic button and the wheels the transesophageal probe can also be flexed it can be anti flex retro flex right flex left flex what is more interesting is that there are few uh, there are few um, uh, simple movements like say torquing the probe to right brings the right sided structures torquing the probe to the left brings down the uh, left sided structures just advancing or withdrawing one can see the superior structures and inferior structures. And not only that, but by using a multi-planar rotation, we can get extraordinary uh, planar views, 2D planar views of the heart. So the thing is, we have got all the entire 360 degree view of the heart, which we can utilize for a diagnosis and also guiding a lot of interventions. We'll just uh, quickly run through the common views that we use. This is the mid-esophageal five-chamber view. This is the uh, long-axis three-chamber view, an uh, excellent uh, view for looking at the aortomitral intervalvular fibrosa and both the mitral and the aortic wall. This is the upper esophageal 30 to 60 degree view where both the right superior and right inferior pulmonary veins can be seen with a carina in between. This is the short axis view of the heart with the RV inflow and outflow. Um, this is a, a 90 to 110 degree with a right, rightward clockwise rotation. And you can see the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava entering the right atrium. This is the mid esophageal 60 degree view to look at the left atrial appendage. And this is an unusual view of 120 degrees where you can see both the left uh, left superior and left inferior pulmonary vein entering the left atrium with the carina in between. Then you have got a transgastric window to look at the short axis of the heart and also to look at the uh, LV long axis inflow and outflow. And then you get marvelous views of the descending thoracic aorta and the arch of aorta. Uh, these are extraordinary views which can show you a lot of plaques and mobile thrombi in the arch of aorta and can find out the cause of a lot of cryptogenic strokes. But how to learn the transesophageal echo? The best way to learn the transesophageal echo is on the simulators. Now the simulators have gone to a very high level and this is one of the simulators. Now the, uh, the simulation is now real lifelike and it gives you a lot of time to learn each and uh, or each of these views. And there is a study to show that those cardiologists who are trained uh, or the cardiology fellows who are trained conventionally versus those who are trained on simulator at end of two months have much higher, um, higher uh, proficiency, uh, are more proficient to take most of the transesophageal views. Uh, this is our training lab. Uh, for the mannequin training. You can see the two mannequins there and the cardiology fellows being trained. And this is in Mumbai. I would like all of you to visit us here at imust.org. And, uh, and, uh, and there we get 48 hours of rigorous training on the mannequin to learn all the transesophageal views. Uh, 
Now let us look at certain common uses of transesophageal echocardiography, the mitral wall assessment. Now these kind of three-dimensional uh, moving pictures you get while learning on the transesophageal echo to know your anatomic plane. Now these are the, uh, uh, the now these are the transesophageal planes which give you entire uh, the, the entire visualization of each and every scallop of AML and PML. Now this is a zero degree view which uh, which shows your P2 and the A2 here, but just pull it out and uh, when you open up the LVOT, you see the P1 and the A1. You go on a 60 degree view and you have bicommissural view which shows you P1 here, P3 here and the A2 in the center. And then you go to 90 degrees and from 90 degrees, you just rotate medially and you see a good amount of P3 and a, a, a part of A3. And then you go to 120 degrees and you see A2 and P2. Uh, the 3D, when you turn it on and uh, acquire a data set, it gives you an incremental value and you get these kind of pictures, which actually the surgeons love because that is how they think of the mitral wall. So this is the LA appendage. This is the uh, position of the uh, left ventricular outflow tract and AML. This is the lateral commission, medial commission, and you can see the PML is having a P2, which is flail. The ASD assessment is very routine part of transesophageal echo. And, uh, one, and, and these are the planes um, which you can utilize to see all the borders of a, a, a ASD for the suitability of device closure. So this is a zero degree view and you can see the mitral wall margin here and the uh, posterior superior atrial margin. And this is the uh, short axis view where you see the retroaortic margin and the posterior inferior atrial margin. And this is, a, uh, this is a place where actually at 70 to 80 degrees, you see the IVC side of the margin. And then you go to 110 and you see the superior vena cava side of the margin. And that tells you when it is more than 5 millimeter, you know that this is very, very suitable for a regular device closure. The in cryptogenic strokes, when you are actually seeing the arch of aorta properly and ruled out that there are no, uh, no, no plaques there and the LA appendage and no clots, you can look at the saline bubble contrast with uh, Valsava. And you can see in this patient that the septum now, now bows towards the LA and the PFO literally opens up and there is a good amount of right to let shunt. And this is a very large right to left shunt with the Valsava maneuver. LA appendage looking for the clot. The, uh, the one like this before the mitral interventions or looking uh, before the cardioversion. And these are the pectinic muscles, which may sometimes get misdiagnosed at the, as the LA appendage clot. Now, the, uh, now these are the uh, routine ones and the mitra clip has made T as a center stage of your cath lab. And the mitra clip is used before you think of a patient for mitra clip, you should be sure about the severity of MR and the mechanism of MR. And as you know, the Carpentier type 2, where either there's an A2 or P2 prolapse or fail, or the, um, or the secondary MRs, these are the targets for the mitra clip. And uh, a T is useful to look for the suitability for the mitra clip. And this is the P2 prolapse. And what you measure is the flail gap, which should be less than 10 millimeter. Look at the moving PML uh, size, it should be more than 10 millimeter. There should not be any calcium at the grasping site. And the uh, flail width you can measure on the 3D, which should be less than 15 millimeters. And for secondary mitral regurgitations, you look for the uh, flail, uh, you look for the depth of cooptation, which should be less than 11 millimeter, or look at the at the cooptation uh, of the leaflet, which should be at least two millimeters. Now these are the patients which are very ideal for the mitra clip. Now the transesophageal echo becomes almost a center piece for this intervention because everything is TE guided. As you can see that even the septal puncture is T guided because you have to be quite posterior and slightly superior. And then you can, uh, uh, then while you are positioning your steerable guide catheter or the clip delivery systems, it is entirely under the, uh, it is entirely under the T guidance that you, uh, that you can tell the interventional cardiologist that he is whether he's away from the LA free wall, whether he's close to LA free wall so that he can safely steer it towards the mitral wall. When it is very close to the mitral wall, you can also 
uh, you can also guide the internationalist whether you are at the A2P2 or you are deviated to A3P3. Uh, not only that, when the clip arms open, you can on the 3D, you can see whether the clip arms are well oriented to the cooptation line or not. Without 3D imaging, it is virtually impossible to do mitra clip. Now, you can see that it is not well oriented. You will have to rotate it clockwise to make it perfectly perpendicular to the cooptation line. And once you enter the left ventricle, you can drop the grain and again see the orientation of your clip arms. And when the clips are closed, you can see whether the, both the leaflets are caught and whether the uh, mitral regurgitation has reduced. So TE has be become uh, is indispensable. Both the 3D TE and the 2D TE has become indispensable for most of the mitral wall procedures, especially the mitral clip or the trans mitral wall or trans catheter mitral wall replacement. And immediately on the table, you can look whether the MR has reduced by looking at the behavior of the pulmonary vein flow. That before the clip, you can see there is hardly any systolic forward flow. The moment you have closed the clip. There is a good amount of forward flow in systole telling you that the ALA pressure has dramatically fallen. Uh, so, so, uh, so, so, my dear friends, I will advise you to go to the Journal of Indian Academy of Echocardiography, where we have published the Indian Academy of Echocardiography guidelines for per performance of transesophageal echocardiography. And this is the, uh, the journal site, and this is a free download. And uh, we have put a lot of efforts in putting this document, which is 30 plus pages document describing everything about T. And so also we have also published another document on the Journal of Indian Academy of Echocardiography that is called the Transesophageal Echo in uh, Cardioembolic uh, Cardio Cerebrovascular Stroke. Uh, so, uh, so I will uh, advise my dear colleagues to please go through both these, uh, uh, both these uh, uh, articles they are freely available on the uh, site of Journal of Indian Academy of Echocardiography. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Nitin Berkeley, for your uh, precious time and uh, excellent deliberation uh, on transesophageal echo. So uh, we have uh, one question from Dr. Osmani. Uh, he wants to know the re remark about 2D spectral uh, tracking in COVID era. Uh, I would like to ask this question to Dr. Rakesh, sir. Rakesh Gupta, sir. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, can I go to Dr. Navin Nanda, sir? Can no, you what tell? Is the question again. Can you tell me the question? Uh, the question is. Uh, the question is 2D spectral tracking in COVID era. Any role? I, I don't think there is any uh, very good literature on that so far, uh, as far as spectral tracking is concerned. But remember one thing about 2D spectral tracking, it depends quite a bit on the window. <clears throat> if the window is poor, like many of the COVID patients have poor windows, uh, you may not get good results. So, you know, so all, with all the hype that we have with spectral tracking echocardiography, you have to remember that one of the major problem is window problem. If, the, if you don't have a good endocardial definition, like we don't have many times, uh, unless you do contrast echocardiography, then spectral tracking echocardiography results uh, may not really be very accurate. So in COVID patients, uh, that could be a problem in some of them. Thank you, sir. Uh, as there is no more question and we are um, uh, short of time. So just a little um, uh, concluding remarks uh, from uh, uh, Nanda, sir. Can you just conclude this? Yeah, session? Uh, yeah very good. Yeah, thank you very much. I think those are very, very good uh, topics. Uh, I think Dr. Parashar uh, mentioned very much about the left atrial strain. Uh, and that's, that's something which is going to come in the future, although it is not yet in the guidelines. It's not yet mainstream, uh, but I think we all expect it to come very soon, as he mentioned. And uh, I think when it came to Dr. Burkule, he think he did a very great job in <clears throat> looking right from the beginning how to actually uh, get all the uh, images in the echocardiography, transverse of echocardiography. And also he did a great job in telling how you actually do the mitral clip. Uh, how you actually insert the mitral clip. And Dr. Rakesh Gupta actually went a very good overview on strain imaging. 
And I think it's, it's a very important topic, strain imaging. There's no question about that. But I think there are some limitations also. And also, where do you get the strain? Do you get the strain in the mid wall? Do you get it in the endocardium or just underneath the endocardium? All that will affect the strain volume. Now, see, well, there's one difference. See, when you're looking at LV function and you're looking at automatic uh, LV ejection fraction, you can look at it, but then you, can't, you also get an idea how the LV is actually moving. You have that mo notion at all. And supposing the uh, automatic comes up and says 20% and you see the ventricle is moving very well, you know something is wrong. But with the strain, you don't have that, uh, uh, you don't have that actually um, uh, advantage uh, because strain comes with a number. You really don't know how the base was moving towards the apex and just comes with a number and you don't know whether the number is correct or wrong. So that is the problem. That's one thing I would mention. And I think uh, uh, the doctor from uh, Mount Sinai Hospital also showed very some very interesting uh, patients, although there's some problem with the uh, with the slide. So the, overall, uh, it has really been a very great session. Okay. Uh,